Welcome to Table Talk. This will be our first interview. So I'm hoping that it goes well. Please bear with us as we work through any <laughs> learning curve here. I have Greg Swain with me. She yeah. is the co-author of Mahjong, The Art of the Game, a beautiful pictorial. I hope that's the right term. Is that the right term? Sounds uh, great. <laughs> coffee table book. I, I've heard them called coffee table books. Yes. It's not okay. quite as big as a coffee table book, though. So, <laughs> Okay. So um, Mahjong, The Art of the Game is a beautiful coffee table book and or pictorial. Welcome to this interview with Table Talk. I see we have two viewers. I'm so happy to be here with you, Michelle. I have to say, I'm one of your big fans, so I'm oh. delighted to be doing an interview with you. Well, thank you for making yourself available. You're quite the celebrity. <laughs> I, I'm honored that I got to actually meet you at a library book signing event, and it was fabulous. You were so sweet. I mean, you, you and your friend traveled about five hours away <laughs> in the car. I was so honored. Oh, yeah. We we were so excited about it. I mean, it was a long drive, but we chatted the whole way. You know how sometimes between friends you might have that awkward silence? We had the best time the oh, whole good. the whole time. Oh, good. So, yeah, it was a fabulous time. And you produced that fun video, too, of your time. So that was great. Yes. And I'm actually going, you may or may not know, but I'm going to Santa Barbara. Oh, you do know. I'm going to Santa Barbara, so I'm going to vlog that one, too. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. Wonderful. It'll be fun. I see we have six viewers now. Welcome to Table Talk. This session we'll be doing an interview with Greg Swain. So shall we go ahead and get started or would you like to chit chat for a little longer before uh, we have while we have more joining us? We could do anything you want. <laughs> All right. Do, have you played Mahjong today? Well, I did. I actually, well, not with people. I mean, with people, but via computer. Thank God for those computers because they're available all the time, even when I can't find people, you know, nearby to play with. I just go on Mahjong time. Or mm -hmm. actually, you and I have played against each other from time to time. So it's it's really one of my favorite websites. What is your avatar name? Um, well, I really shouldn't disclose it, but I'll tell you. Oh. Dorky77. But my face is oh, up there, Oh, that's too. right. Okay. Dorky Got it. Because I'm from New York, so I had to do the Yorkie thing. Yeah. Oh, I see we have, actually, here we go. We have a couple of comments. So oh. it's functioning, and I'm seeing some comments. I have a comment from Facebook. Hi and hello to Greg Swain. And I have a, I love your book, Lots of History. Ooh, I like that one. <laughs> yeah, very good. All right, well, keep your comments coming as we go. I will try to keep an eye on the chat or the live comments. And if we have time at the end, we'll actually do uh, some Q&A. And if we run out of time, we'll just try to schedule another episode. <laughs> so um, we have 10 viewers. Welcome. If you're just joining, we are just chit-chatting right now. There's always a lot to talk about with Mahjong, I have to say. <laughs> uh, yep. And so we have... Um, kind of outlined a few things that we want to cover tonight, but again, we may just have to do another episode because there's so much to talk about. <laughs> so Let's see. I have not gotten to play today. I worked all day, and then, of course, I prepared for this, so I hope to play maybe later tonight at Mahjong time. Good. If anybody is looking for a place to play online, you could always look at Mahjong time. I have information about that on my Facebook group. If you're not part of the Facebook group, consider following there. I do all kinds of posts about the game, several styles. I upload files. We post events there. And I also post the uh, publish notices for all my videos on YouTube. So consider joining. Well, I think we should go ahead and just get started. I think this will be posted on Facebook, so anybody who missed the live portion or the whole episode will be able to re to watch the repost. We hope. So shall we go ahead and get started? That's okay. Good idea. All right. So tell us how you got started okay. with Mahjong. All right. Well, I grew up in New York City, and so um, 
especially in the summer before air conditioning, I would be walking down the streets and everybody used to um, sit outside their apartment buildings. And they, all these women would be sitting around card tables and they'd be, pl they'd be playing this very mysterious game. And then all this, and you'd hear strange words like dragons and bamboo. And I thought, what is that? And then there'd be all this laughter. So I thought, boy, this looks like a very fun game. But, you know, I really wasn't able to find anybody to teach me how to play the game, but I kept it in the back of my head. And so finally in 2010, I was able to learn how to play the game. And it, I was just so thrilled. Of course, I wish I'd learned how to play it a long time ago, but 2010 is better than not at all. So I feel I've kind of made up for a lot of lost time because I kind of live in Mahjong world now, but um, I just am delighted that I got to learn to play finally. All right. How many, did you take multiple lessons? I I took um, four four group lessons, so four uh, four lessons of two hours each, and then we actually needed another little lesson. Um, and so, but we really started to feel comfortable. We had a wonderful teacher here in New York, um, Linda Feinstein, and she. Oh yeah, I recognize that name. Yeah, she's she's a really wonderful woman, and she teaches people all over the city. So we were very lucky to have such a wonderful teacher. She actually does um, little gatherings on Mondays. A, a, luncheon and mahjong play so she's really gotten a lot of um, publicity because of that so she's terrific so i was very lucky to have her as a teacher and uh, she made me really love the game but i probably would have loved it anyway nice. Nice. And what, what i really like about mahjong is there's just such wonderful camaraderie around the table and you know you really can be there and you're forming friendships around the table while you have an activity so um, I, you, you know, I, I think I mentioned to you that if somebody said, come on over, Greg, and spend three hours chatting with me, I think I'd say, well, no, I'm really sorry. I'm busy. I can't do that because the idea of just chatting with somebody for three hours might be a little bit unnerving. But okay. I think nothing of going over to somebody's house and playing Mahjong. And it turns out we'll be chatting for three, four, five hours. But it, there's just that activity that kind of makes you, um, gives you something to focus on and mm -hmm. just brings all these friends into your lives. Yeah, I agree. I have made some really great friends and I hope to make more. I'm trying to start a brand new group. So with kind of starting from scratch again here in Atlanta, let oh, me just cool. check the chats real quick here. I see that we have 14 viewers right now. If you're brand new, we're talking to Greg Swain about her beautiful coffee table book, Mahjong, The Art of the Game. If you have any questions along the way, just write them as a comment. Uh, let's see here. I've got a thumbs up and a howdy. So things are, <laughs> are working where, here we go. How many, oh, we're gonna get to that. Oh, Somebody no. asked about sets. Oh, we're gonna no. talk about that. So <laughs> let's go ahead and um, you had mentioned about, you know, the sense of belonging and that um, not only is it great for social interaction, but it's great for your brain, don't yeah. you think? No, it's wonderful. And see, I have a background in clinical psychology. So I pay attention to what's good for the brain and certainly um, being with people, interacting with them and then having some intellectual challenges is very good for the brain. And certainly Mahjong offers all of that. But in addition, you know, we have beautiful piles. So I, that appeals to my whole um um, art history background. And so it's just a, it's a beautiful way to spend time with people while, you know, hopefully enriching those gray cells up there and definitely enriching lives just by the friendships. Absolutely. I mean, it makes you think it's analytical, it's strategic, and it's beautiful. It's artistically beautiful. So there are so many, right. and it's tactile right. and, and it's audible. I mean, yeah. every, it's almost like every sense of your body is involved when you play oh, Mahjong. Absolutely. absolutely. I don't know of any other game that is so intricate and beautiful as far as the design. Do you? I, I, I don't I don't really know. I mean, people who play chess, I mean, there are some really, really beautiful. Oh, chess that's pieces. true. But, you know, the people who play chess really don't do that much talking. It's pretty serious. Mm -hmm. So I don't think there's any game that's as beautiful that has as, as many opportunities for friendship as Mahjong does. Yeah, that one's kind of cere cerebral, isn't it? Yes, it is. But Mahjong <laughs> doesn't get enough credit for being cerebral. It is pretty cerebral. But the thing I really like about it is I don't have to remember what's been discarded because it's all face up. <laughs> 
Yeah, <laughs> it's not a game of concentration. Right. So tell me a little bit about how you actually got started in all the the art okay. uh, ideas and your interest in the in the uh, designs of Mahjong come to a book format. Right. So what happened is I took lessons in 2010 along with Anne Israel, and um, after the after the games finished. Um, Anne bought a beautiful Bakelite set, and we would all go over to her house to play and have lunch and play with her set. And that was lovely, but I thought, you know what, I'd like to get a set too. And I was very interested in the hand-carved sets. So I looked on eBay and I found some hand, a hand-carved set, and I was uh, attracted to it because I thought that um, the tiles were wonderful, and that's something I'll talk about later. But I, I like to look for sets where something says something to me. So I ordered. I don't. I'm hoping you'll be able to see this. I I'm I bought the way so I can see. Okay, I oh bought. My goodness. I bought this set, and I really bought it because I just thought that the um, phoenix was the cutest thing I've ever seen with such attitude. I just really loved it. What is the I name? Also, is Does that set have a name? Kind of like, it seems like some of them have nicknames almost. Well, they, they can. I, I would call this the strutting phoenix, quite honestly, because he's, he's a strutting phoenix with attitude. So, I mean, that's what I like. And I also love the shape of the BAM. I think I just love the shape of this BAM. So I bought this set and I thought, boy, that's a really wonderful set. And, you know, because the National Mahjong League kept on changing the number of jokers and flower mm -hmm. tiles, et cetera, et cetera, the person who had this set, and, you know, this set was carved in the 1920s, but the person who had this set probably, I don't know, in the 40s or 50s when the league was changing the numbers of tiles, all of a sudden realized that she wasn't going to be able to play with the set. Oh, um, because she needed to find some other tiles. So she found some other tiles, which were fairly well matched, but they were covered over in those big red joker stickers. Okay, at least it wasn't nail polish. <laughs> yeah, it, well, but this was 50 or 60 years old. Okay. And it was really, really disgusting. So first thing I did is I took off the red sticker and I found... This tile, if you can see this, this tile, which is just so beautifully carved. I really just, I flipped when I saw this tile because it's a, it looks like a portrait of a man. So, hmm. and I thought, you know, this is really incredible carving. And, you know, don't forget these are about one and one and a quarter inch high or whatever. Mm -hmm. And the, the carving is very, very fine. So, um, I thought, well, let me let me go ahead and Google and let me find out what um, about Mahjong art, because I, I know about art. I don't know about Chinese art, but let me go ahead and Google the concept Mahjong art. So I Googled and it turns out there was nothing written about Mahjong art. And so then, of course, I got very, very excited because there was nothing written about Mahjong art. I thought, well, maybe I can find out about Mahjong art, put that art history background to to work wow. for me. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I, I called I called Anne, who wrote a column and she knows um, a photographer, Michelle Arnaud, whose wife, Jane Creech, is a book agent. And when Anna and I talked to them, we thought, well, maybe we'll just do a private printing or something. And Jane said, no, this is a great idea. We should just be taking this to publishers. So uh, my husband, Woody, is an art director. So we all put the book together. And so the rest is history. But we had, we had the best time putting it together. And um, we had wonderful people that I had met through through, really through eBay and through the internet. So mm -hmm. uh, Catherine Hartman and Bill Price and Susan West from Mahjong Mahjong were all instrumental in getting the book to happen. And they allowed us to invade their homes with camera mm -hmm. equipment, et cetera. And I mean, we were there. Trust me, Catherine Hartman couldn't even get through the front uh, the front hallway of her of her <laughs> house because all the camera equipment was there, and she couldn't use her living room or her dining room either. So, I mean, that's that's what it was like. And these people were just so incredibly kind to us. And but we're very excited about the book that we were able to get because of everybody being so kind. Wow, what an amazing experience. Yeah, oh was. my goodness, I bet you were just on cloud nine this whole process. I really was, I really was. But what was also exciting is I 
you know, we had the book proposal and um, Tuttle was interested. Then I thought, oh, my goodness, I don't really know anything about Chinese art. So then I had to do a real cram course in Chinese art. And um, then that really opened up my eyes because it's Chinese art is very unusual in that Sometimes it's the image, but the image can have lots of layers of symbolism. Mm -hmm. And so that I found fascinating, too. Well, yeah, there's just really, really deep culture and tradition with the in, in China. And I'm sure that's true for most areas of the world. You know, everyone has their culture and traditions right. and such. But it just seems like in China, everything is so intricate and meaningful and yeah. purposeful. Right. And what I also love about the art is sometimes it's not just the art, but it's the way the word is pronounced. Oh. So um, that I also thought fascinating, too. So it could have meaning because of what it is, but also the way it's pronounced. So it's 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 been a lot of fun. So have you learned how to speak what, Mandarin or Cantonese through any of this? <laughs> no, and I'm always hoping that when I try to pronounce some Chinese words, there's nobody there in the audience. That's how I feel when I play Ricci. <laughs> <laughs> I, I always apologize and say, okay, this is Sanshoku. Now, I don't know if that's the correct pron pronunciation, but yeah, correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> I hear you. I hear you. <laughs> we try to participate. We do our best. We Americans. Right. right. All right. Well, let's see. Our next question is, how many sets do you own? Well, I can honestly say I have no idea. I can honestly say I don't want to count. <laughs> yes, sitting in here, I, I have an office and I have sets all over the shelves, which thank goodness you can't see. I have sets inside the cabinet, which you can't see. I have a couple sets here behind me that I thought you would see. Um, but then my son, who used to live at home, moved out when he was about 24 or so. And I always say nature abhors a vacuum. So his closet was empty. So oh. I, of course, had to do something about that. So I had to have more shelves put in his closet. And uh -huh. God help any guest who tries to spend any time in the guest room. There's not much closet space left. <laughs> oh. Did you happen to see on Mahjong That's It, somebody posted a a beautiful picture of her bedroom and the the way she per, she um displayed her mahjong sets do you see that yes that was really oh wonderful. my goodness so beautiful it yeah. it really kind of inspired me uh, i must say oh that's good that's yeah. good <laughs> makes me want to buy some vintage sets yes that's good all right so tell me about um with your your sets, what attracts you most to to any given set? Is there anything in particular that draws your eye? Well, you know, so sad. Basically, I like everything. So it, it, it's a major problem. And really doing the book was something that really I shouldn't have done because I was exposed to all these incredible sets you know, everywhere. And so I had this long, long, long wish list of things. And, um, but I love, I love the handmade ones. I love beautiful design, but um, I love quirky. Um, and I'll show you some quirky ones in a minute, but yes, I, I just want something to, to talk to me in some kind of way to, mm -hmm. and I always tell people, you know, if you're looking for a set, find something that really is talking to you that is saying, Hey, come over here and, and look at me because you will be able to find an emotional connection with a set. And that's just a wonderful thing to have to be emotionally connected with your set because that set is going to give you so many hours of pleasure and friendship. And if you're dealing with a vintage set, that set already has so many good hours in it of providing happiness to people. So that's really one of the reasons I really just adore vintage sets. And, you know, the hand carved ones are wonderful. So even a lot of the bone and bamboo, I showed you some of the bone and bamboo tiles mm -hmm. that I have. Um, there's another set that I'll show you. It actually is a banner for my website, Mahjong Treasures. And I think you're going to yeah. like one, Michelle, because it's French ivory. But um, <laughs> anyway, <laughs> this is, um, can you see it's that's Oh my goodness. Day, um, that is one of my favorites that I have. I haven't seen live. I've just seen photos. Right. This Beautiful. is this, 
you know, you asked me what my favorite set is, and it really is this set. And this is the White Dragon. So it's a um, one bam, and it's a bird on a Buddha's hand, which is a type of citron. citron. And um, so that appears over and over in Mahjong tiles. But then I thought, oh, my goodness, the one the, the white dragon is just so beautiful. And wow. then it came, it came with um, 16 flowers and I'll show you. And so um, I'll just show you the 16 flowers. What's, no, I'll show you four, but they're, um, they're interconnected, which is a lot of fun. Let me see if I can do this right. Uh, let me, while you're doing that, let me, let me let you know a question here. Are you, do, do you do any refurbishing? I'm, I got into this thinking that I would do refurbishing and then I soon realized what a terrible mistake that was for me to think <laughs> I could do refurbishing. There are some really good experts out there like mm -hmm. Johnny Levine and Catherine Hartman. A number of people really do beautiful refurbishing. I do my best, but I'm not that, I'm not that great. Oh my goodness. That's almost like a panorama. Exactly. And what's really fun is how this, how the tiles really are connected. Wow. Oh my goodness. Flowers like this. So I have never seen anything like that on yeah. a set. So needless to say, when you have 16 beautiful works of art, you're not going to cover eight of them with a sticker. So the other day <laughs> I came up with an idea and I'm going to get some of those tiny little dots that some people put on their Mahjong cards when they've mastered a hand, mm -hmm. a little dot in the blank space on eight tiles and not, those will be the jokers. And then at the end of every game, I'll take that little dot off. So that's not okay. to hurt the tile. And so that that's going to be, you know, that's how I'm going to deal with it because nobody should be deprived of seeing these beautiful tiles. So. Oh, that is a great idea. Oh my goodness. I, I actually had a question a minute ago and I was so fascinated that thought just flew right out of my mind. Those flowers were gorgeous. They are. Let me show you some other, like I told, I talked to you about my quirkies. I've got, I've got some other little quirky things here. I just got this set the other day and I don't even know that I'll be able to play with it, but I have sets that I won't be able to play with. But these, these, can you see these? These are the flowers. Yeah, these, little Buddhas. Like little Buddhas. But okay. they're just hysterical looking. I mean, I just. I think <laughs> happy Buddha? Is it a happy Buddha? Yeah, he looks kind of happy. I'm not quite sure what all's going on, but he's pretty. He's pretty <laughs> happy. He's pretty happy. So I'm excited. Those about colors that. are kind of um, uh, sort of against the norm because usually we have uh, red, green, and or and dark blue. Yep. But it looks like there's some other colors in there that I've not normally seen. Exactly, and, and the set is very peculiar. I mean, it's fun, but it's not like your normal set. So now I'm going to show you. Um, I talked about quirky. And so here are, here are some red dragons. Somebody painted this set and I, I had to buy it. I mean, oh somebody, my goodness, I see them. Somebody made this set for probably somebody in the family. So that to me, that, that has a lot of meaning. So those are the reds. Uh, for then, a minute, I thought they were kitty cats. I know, I know. Well, it's, you know, it's a little bit of folk art, you know, but then here we've got, here we've got the, um, Oh, I've got to like make it. While you're doing that, I just want to say someone saying hello to both you and I. Oh, that's nice. Here are the green ones, and they're just so dark. Oh, they're just wow. so. Wow. And then, uh, and then they have a really dark uh, background. Yeah, and then here are here are the um, the white dragons, but they just are cute. So somebody somebody made that for oh, their wow. child. I think. Oh, how clever! Look at that. Isn't that not the cutest thing you've ever wow. seen. So, you well, know, what is the material? What is it on? Well, believe it or not, it's a three layer. It's three layers. So somebody went to a lot of trouble unless they were just able to find this wood commercially. But, um, you know, I love the fact that somebody did this or really probably as a gift for somebody in the family is my guess. Now, I will never be able to play with this set because I'm never going to be able to find any matching jokers or anything else. But you know what? It's just a little treasure, and I just gave it to myself as a present. Okay. While you're looking for a, 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 the next show and tell, somebody asked, where do you find the sets? Um, I find them everywhere. Um, I, of course, do a lot of eBay. eBay's hard, though, because uh, that's really kind of everybody's first destination. But what I end up doing is anytime I go into an antique store or 
I just automatically say, do you have any mahjong sets? That's like my number one question. But sometimes they don't know because a lot of antique stores are really malls and they don't necessarily know what everybody has. But anytime there's a box, I basically go over and open the box. Okay. <laughs> and I did that. I did that um, in Salem, New York, and I found a wonderful set that um, was actually turned into um, – a Mahjong solitaire matching game. It's a beautiful bone and bamboo set. And Redstone Games turned it into a Mahjong solitaire game, which allows people to really match. It's those tile matching games, mm -hmm. but yeah. it's exposing people to vintage sets and they probably have never seen vintage sets. And it's mm -hmm. just, it's really, it's terrific. So anyway, I got that just by opening up a box that was covered with paper. So wow, that's just rummaging and there box. it was. Yeah, yep. Oh my goodness. Yep. And I never thought of doing that. I've always heard, seen pictures of people on Mahjong That's It Facebook group. I, I've seen pictures of people saying, look what I stumbled on at, a, at an estate sale or, exactly. or a garage sale or what have you. And I've yeah. never seen a Mahjong set anywhere. Yeah. But the next time I go or pass by an antique shop, I'm going to stop in and ask. You have to. You have to. Yeah, fascinating. Yeah. So that's, that's my best resource. Um, you know, sometimes I can be lucky and somebody's selling a set, and so then they will offer it to me too. But okay. Okay, I'm just going to show you this. I just got this. Um, I'm never going to be able to play with this, but I just I just bought it because the um, somebody painted these. These are the flowers. Oh, and wow. Aren't, aren't, okay. they, aren't they cute? I mean, I'm never going to play with this, but it's just so darn cute. And obviously <laughs> I like cute and quirky. So... Um, so what I'm trying to say here, Michelle, is that, you know, if you want to have a, a fun set, you know, price point doesn't have to be an issue. There are really fun sets out there that aren't that expensive, but have some, you know, some history and we don't even necessarily know what the history is, but it, somebody spent a lot of time and effort doing something fun for somebody else. You just reminded me of what that thought was that I had. Okay. Remember, remember when you were telling me about the older sets? I just had got, I literally got a chill thinking about how, you know, there's a sentiment that comes with yeah. games. And I just wonder about spirits, you know, those yeah. joyful spirits that might accompany a set just historically. I mean, I don't know if I believe in that kind of thing, but the thought came to my mind that those sets would travel with the spirits of those who played and yeah. just bring that extra level of joy to a game. Oh, I think it does. I mean, just you, you mentioned that, and this isn't about a set, but, you know, people really love their Mahjong sets because they really did bring people together in times of trouble and certainly during wars and everything else. But I just, I found, I found this little piece and it, this actually is something that would have been used for oh, Chinese. Oh, I know what, okay. And it's needle pointed. Somebody went to the trouble of needle pointing this and putting a nice little back on it too, because they wanted to use this for their Mahjong games. So when you nice. get little, um, when you get some of the vintage sets, you end up finding little treasures sometimes inside them. So that's always fun too. And sometimes you'll have people's names. And mm -hmm. I have one set where there were four ladies who got together every week. And so they would keep their, their counters in their little drawer that was labeled with their names so that they could take up where they left off the last week. It's really cute. Wow. Well, I, I actually have seen where people have opened sets that they've purchased and find those kinds of surprises like years and years of national mahjong league cards or really old rules that are just tattered and oh, disintegrating yeah. they're so old well that's loved. just really fascinating yeah. somebody asked about do you ever um recommend any kind of a monetary limit when considering purchasing a set is there anything just outlandish that you would recommend avoiding well, I, well, okay. So let's let's back let's back up a little bit. I think that everybody should have a set that they don't have to worry about, that they can take okay. to the park and play over concrete. And you know, if something happens to a tile, they'll be able to replace the tile. So I think everybody should have a regular set that they're really not going to worry too much about. Mm -hmm. But I think. Some of these other sets, the vintage sets, 
um, they really do so much to enrich your life. Now, let me just talk a little bit about a vintage set and how to care for a vintage set. Okay. You cannot take your vintage set to play out on the street on over the concrete because if the tile falls, it probably will crack or chip and you're probably going to have an awfully difficult time replacing it. Mm -hmm. I also say you do not ever like throw tiles up in the, well, I, I don't let anybody throw tiles up in the air anyway, <laughs> but um, I will often, I always say, please do not, you know, flip the tiles when you're trying to mix them, just wash them and, you know, show off your manicure, mm -hmm. show off your rings and watches, just nicely wash the tiles on the table. So that, those are two rules that I have. Okay. Um, carpet underneath and careful washing on top. But Good that, idea. You know, it all depends on, um, what people want. I mean, you can find some wonderful sets at some pretty decent price points. Um, but, you know, you just have to figure out what it is that you are willing to spend. But some people don't mind spending a lot of money having their hair done or, you know, doing something. Mm -hmm. I don't get I don't get my hair done. I did it myself a couple hours ago. So I, I like to think all the money that I'm saving that way. I'm spending on Mahjong sets. Save it for Mahjong. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, let me see here if we've, um, as oh, I do want to, if I could just, oh. interrupt. there was somebody there, is, there are people who know about the game, but don't necessarily know about the value of sets. So okay. there is somebody out there who says, Oh, never spend more than a hundred dollars for a set. Um, that's actually not correct. I mean, when you're buying some wonderful old vintage sets, you will be spending more than a hundred dollars. So, okay. so, Every day functional under a hundred dollars, but at something that's going to be a bit of a treat, even some of the ones from where the wind blows or uh, Mahjong Mavens or John Davis does some wonderful new sets, you know, those, those will be fun things to have and, um, you know, a little bit special. Okay. Very good. Well, I, I'm so excited because I'm on the hunt for my first vintage set full set. I have some orphan tiles that um, maybe I'll post after this um, session and I'll, I'll post my little picture of my china cabinet with the some vintage tiles that I have that are just orphans, but I hope to have a vintage set and I've decided on a price point, so we'll see what happens. Okay, good, good, good. So speaking of the vintage tiles, I mean, nowadays they seem to all be made of either two kinds of plastic, but, um, and maybe we can get to that in a moment, but what about the vintage sets and, and the materials that were used in the vintage sets? Okay. You mentioned bone and bamboo, right. catalin and bakelite, but right. if, can you kind of expand on that a little bit? Oh, of course, of course. Well, let me just backtrack to say that originally Mahjong was a card game. So it started on paper. But of course, there are issues with paper and certainly the cards could crease and everything. And so they, they quickly moved to bamboo. And so bamboo was out there, but there's a reason why we have bamboo cutting boards. And it's because bamboo is really, really hard. It's okay. a very hard surface. So we think that bamboo was really the first surface, surface that the craftsmen went to after paper. But then um, they took the bamboo and put bone in front of the bamboo and they dovetailed the two together. And the reason they did that is that the bone wasn't thick enough. And when the Chinese would play um, mahjong, tiles would stand up on the table. So that little bit of extra bamboo in the back made it easier for the tiles to stand up. Okay. Now, a lot of people say that they have ivory sets and a few people do, but by and large, most of the sets out there are bone and bamboo, and that's not a bad thing. There are bone and bamboo sets that sell for more than ivory sets, depending on the images. So bone, bone is a good thing. It's fine okay. not to worry about it. And <laughs> then, but what happened is in China in the 1920s, when the Mahjong scene was exploding, Mahjong became the sixth biggest export from China and was really helping to save the Chinese economy. And the Chinese didn't have anything going for them and they really ran out of bone. So they got the cattlemen in Nebraska and Chicago to send them their bone left over from steaks, et cetera. And so those guys sent all the bones over to China, but of course that was expensive and it took a long time. So 
that was at a time when plastics were coming about. So that was oh. when Bakelite was invented, et cetera. And so tiles started being made of plastics. And there's a uniquely, um, there's a unique, well, I could say unique, but it's really, um, it's called Chinese Bakelite, but it's not unique because there are probably about a hundred different chemical formulas for it. But um, it is a wonderful plastic that allowed the craftsman to carve while it was still somewhat soft. So they oh, were oh, interesting, very intricate, fine lines. And I have I have a fun set, and I just I I wanted to show this to you because this is like some of the fun about mahjong. This this is a photographer taking pictures of all these girls who are modeling. Can you see that? I can. That looks kind of art deco almost. Yeah, it is. It is. It really is from that time. So, but this is Chinese Bakelite. And sometimes Chinese Bakelite tiles will have a different color on the back. So that's like a wafer back. Okay. But, um, so that that came on the on the scene. And so they, they, they started doing that. And then Catalan was a very good product. And Catalan allowed for several different, for different colors. So that's when you really have like the two-tone sets, which are wonderful, those wonderful in robe sets, and then those those dovetailed sets. Oh my, I don't well, have- I think a lot of people know what the dovetail means, but can you go into what enrobed means? Sure. Someone had just asked about that. Right, an enrobed set has, um, well, I'll just pick up this tile, but it's as it's covered. Oh. This is a red back. So, but this it, the enrobed set would be covered on all four sides and the back with a different color. So okay. every single tile looks like it's in a picture frame. Oh, interesting! So it looks very special, and the colors are beautiful. And in robe, in robe sets and two tone and um, the dovetailed ones. Be still my heart. Um, those go for a lot. <laughs> they go for more money than some of the hand carved sets. Okay. Uh, there are no bargains out there unless you just get super lucky somewhere. What might a, a price point be for a dovetail set? And usually they have a contrasting back, right? Yes, exactly. Obviously, the, to the, show the, that dovetail. The what, front, front side would be kind of a cream, and then the dovetails can be green or red or. Um, I've seen black too. I don't have any, but um, anyway, those those are all easily in the thousands. I mean, two thousand, three thousand. You're not oh. going to get any of those for less than two thousand dollars unless you just got really super lucky and somebody made a big mistake. Is that true for the enrobed sets too? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Wow. What well, I always do is I look on eBay to see sold, and then I see what things have sold for, and that kind oh, of gives me an that's idea. a good idea. That's a really good idea for anybody right. on the hunt for a vintage set. Use eBay as a source for pricing. Right, the sold ones. As soon as long as they've sold, don't don't do it for what they're asking. Right, because they're usually in a bid war, and you never know what they're going to end up at. Right. So that's a good point. All right, let's see here. Um, I just wanted to mention that. My grandfather came here from the Philippines and he brought a set with him, Bone and Bamboo. And my brother, who's the oldest of five brothers and sisters, so there's six of us, he's the oldest, he got it. So Does I don't have it. Does he play? Um, he knows how to play Wright Patterson style. Okay. I don't know if they play very much, but he's got the set. Well, so maybe every now and again, set. maybe it should go around to all family members. I don't know if he's going to get, I don't know if he'll let his hands off of that. Oh. <laughs> I think he, he's, it's precious to him, I think. Oh. Well, I can understand that. And I think he, of all of us probably will, will have had probably the strongest relationship with my grandfather anyway, because we were all younger. And so anyway, all right, well, let's see here. Um, what I had a question here myself. Um, oh, no, no, that's fine. Okay, let's see here. Um, While you're looking, I'm just going to show you this, this fantastic, you know, we've got some new people who are making beautiful, beautiful sets. And one of them is Dee Gallo, who, you know, is just such a talented craftswoman. But I just want, this is a set that she made with Chris Lloyd. I just got this yesterday. And if you oh, notice the way the fans are, they fan? are has to do with the way the winds are. So the south fan faces the oh. opening is at the, I mean, if the big fan is at the bottom. These, 
these winds are just so beautiful. So this is a set that Dee made with Chris Lloyd. And Chris Lloyd is doing some very interesting new sets these days. Oh, really? Yeah. Is this the one who who ha who has the, um, there's some kind of a designer name? There's a, I, I recently saw a game that was like 3,000 or 5,000 or some yeah. outrage, yes. like Louboutin or something like that. Yes. There are a number of games. There are a number of um, designers who've come out with um, Mahjong sets, but um, I would say that the ones I've seen, it tends to be a lot of um, what the packaging is, like the leather is really beautiful, but the sets that I've seen have not impressed me at all. And basically it seems like sometimes they've really just taken a regular old set and then just put it in a beautiful, beautiful designer case. I know that's not oh, always, yeah. it's not always the case, but um, Chris Lloyd is doing some very nice things. They're out of Providence and they've got a fun one that they've just done now having to do, um, they got a New Yorker cartoonist to do the images and they're very fun and clever. So take a look, even if you can't buy it, take a look. It's really fun. So that would be uh, C R I S O L O I D. C R I S L O I D. Yes. Okay, and we would yeah. just Google it and probably find them. Right. But they're they're creating sets today. Yes. Okay. Yes. Very good. Did I know? I believe we touched on caring for a set when there are stickers involved on a vintage set. What about general care aside from the sticker problem? Right. <laughs> the sticker problem is, of course, huge, and the nail polish problem is huge. Mm -hmm. But you really, they, you, believe it or not, nail polish will come off. I just use a very, the a very light nail polish thing, and I'm very careful with it. But I, you can get nail polish off. But I made the mistake of looking at a website years ago with somebody who said, well, just go ahead and use alcohol to clean your tiles. Well, you don't use alcohol mm -hmm. to clean a vintage set. Okay. I used it on a Peng Chow tile and all the paint came off. So mm -hmm. I learned very quickly that you can't necessarily trust how people tell you to maintain sets. You have to really listen to people who really are experts as opposed to people who might know a lot but don't necessarily know how to care for a vintage set. Um, I, I when I get a set, I just have a very um, slightly damp um, paper towel or, or rag, and then I wipe all parts of the, each tile. And I'm very careful because some of the paints might not be color fast. And so okay. I'm always worried that the paint is gonna come off. So that's something to really be worried about. But you can really clean a set very nicely just using a little damp towel and that's that's what I do with my sets. Now I will tell you I know of a couple horror stories, one of which I just heard the other day, but a woman told me that her friend had bought a very expensive Chinese Bakelite set and I guess she thought it was a little dirty and she put it in the dishwasher. Uh oh. Yeah. So I I'm I, actually surprised uh... the tile survived. I I know that no paint remained on the tiles, but I'm kind of surprised oh. that the tiles were able to even, you know, sustain that type of temperature. So just if you have a vintage set, just really make sure you, we have so many files on Mahjong, that's it. And um, there are people who can help. People have talked about baby wipes, cleaning a set with baby wipes. I okay. haven't done that, but those that's that's with vintage. Okay. So do you, for today's uh, current day or, you know, contemporary sets, is it okay to use alcohol and, and maybe dilute it with water on the current sets? Right. I, I still don't know about alcohol. It's probably fine. I have heard that some of the people who run tournaments put all the tiles after the tournament in those net bags and they dunk them up and down in the swimming pool. They're lucky enough to have a swimming pool to do that with, but they figure, you know, the chlorine is oh. sanitize the tiles. Okay. Well, I know that there are chlorinated tablets that we could probably buy and put it in the sink or something. Right. I don't have a pool, but I might be able to do something in my sink. Right. I actually went on Sloperama and I found a few ideas of cleaning and one of them was the isopropyl alcohol. And so I tried that. It didn't affect my tiles, but now I'm, I need to go put a note under that video to make sure that I put a disclaimer in there about right. vintage tiles. I may have done that, but I'm going to double check now. Yeah. Yeah, please. I, I would not want to be responsible for that. Oh, that would be horrible. 
All right. Um, so tell us, somebody had, had asked a few minutes ago, and I'd like to know if you actually play Mahjong today, and maybe even if you play with any of your sets. Well, today was not a good day in, in terms of playing with people. I, um, I had a lot of paperwork to do, but I did make some time to go on Mahjong time and played a few games, so that was fun. And I also went on real Mahjong, which I really love also, because I do think it's a really good version of it. And I like ma Mahjong.net too, which is so good for people beginning, um, and very helpful. And then of course there's that app on my iPhone, American Mahjong 2018, that I, oh. that, you know, oh, please, you can't get away from Mahjong anymore. But, <laughs> um, so I didn't play with any sets today, but I'm hoping I, I played this weekend with a, a new friend and we played Siamese. Thank you, Gladys Grad, for Siamese. Oh, yes. And um, so I, I, I love, I love, love, love playing. And um, I, and playing with vintage sets really just kind of adds a little extra something, I think. And so I must, you mentioned all the National Mahjong League sites. Do you play more versions than American style? Um, I do know how to play Hong Kong, and I'm trying to teach myself, Richie, and thank you, you know, Michelle, for your videos, and I'm really trying to immerse myself because um, I've noticed that uh, there, there are some sets that I just love that I'm never going to be able to play with because oh. I'm never going to be able to get matching jokers. But there yeah. are all these other versions out there like Wright Patterson and you do that and mm -hmm. Ricky and Hong Kong. And uh, so I'm really trying to learn some of the other versions too so I can play with some of these sets that I love but I can't play with. I don't want to just stare at them, but I do stare at them. That's a great them. idea. Yay. And that's what I intend to use if once I do get a vintage set, which I hope to have one soon, it's going to be the right set, though, so I'm not in a rush. But I plan to let that one be my uh, Wright Patterson set. I have, a, I have a Cantonese set. I have a Japanese set. Well, I've got more than one because I teach. But my favorites, I have a favorite Cantonese, a favorite Japanese. I have my favorite American. And now I need my favorite Wright Pat. So I'm on the hunt. Okay. <laughs> well, listen, we have about 15 minutes left. I wonder if there's anything else that you'd like to talk about in regards to design and materials and culture and history, if there's anything else that maybe we've missed that our viewers might be interested in hearing about. Well, I, you know, I just might mention that, um, I, I, I just found this, I just found this fascinating. I'm just picking up this cute little photographer tile, but, um, I just want people to know that it's not just the images on the tiles that can be interesting. There are words here too. This Chinese, this Chinese symbol is actually a word and it means something. And here in the States, we tend to think that if you see an image, the image and the word are related and they're not necessarily related at all on Mahjong tiles. So that's been interesting. And the craftsmen have been able to put, you know, they might put poetry on it. They might put a little bit of propaganda. One of my favorite sets that somebody has, um, uh, if you translate the words, it means equal rights for women. And that was oh. a set that was carved in the 1930s. Oh, so, wow. There's this wonderful man, Ray Heaton, who's been doing a lot of translating for us. And he's learned a lot of the um, important Chinese stories. And he knows when something, you know, when there are four words put together, he really knows what story that's pertaining to. So that's been a lot of fun to, to, to learn culture that way from the little words on the tiles. Wow. And is there a lot of this um, mentioned in your book? Um, a little bit is, a little bit is, but they, they were, we were really just kind of finding out about things back then, and Ray did a couple of translations for us, but when we were putting the book together, it was really like 2012, and we handed it in in 2013, and since then, we've learned so much about what really is on those tiles, and, and um, so that's, that's been fascinating. Oh, I'm sure. Well, I have your book and I've looked at it many times and it's in my China cabinet on display. Whenever I have family over, I get it out because it is fascinating. Where can we find your book? 
Well, you can find it. I happen to be biased toward actual bookstores, and maybe your bookstore would order a copy of the book. Um, you can get it um, if it's an online thing. I do push Barnes and Noble because they are a brick and mortar bookstore. And then you, you know you can always get it from Amazon. And mm -hmm. when I do go around to give some talks, I I take books with me, and people can buy them then. Okay, very good. And how can we, uh, you mentioned earlier that you have a website. I'm, I'm assuming we can, if we wanted to contact you, yes. um, we could reach out to you through Facebook, your website, if you can right. just let us know about that a little bit. Yeah, my website is called Mahjong Treasures, and I spelled it M-A-H-J-O-N-G, just oh. one G, treasures.com. Mm -hmm. And I have to say, it's been a little inactive for a while, but I, I, tr I still get at least 300 hits a day, three to 400 Ooh. a day, yeah. And nice. I really try to make it a resource for people who have questions about um, anything having to do with Mahjong, art, et cetera. And um, so that that's a really good resource. And I have a few things on Facebook too, but it tends to be more event related. Okay, very good. Well, let me just look at the, we do have a few sort of miscellaneous questions here. Maybe I can just go over those for the next little bit here. Um, we have a lot of people saying hi, of course. Oh, good. Somebody had asked something about melamine. I, I'm sh That's a material of some kind. Yeah. Are there melamine sets? You know, I, the, the person who knows all about materials is a guy named Tony Watson, and he's in he's in England, and he's a real expert on the chemical makeup of tiles. So I okay. I cannot answer that question, but I know Tony Watson would know the answer. Okay, I'll, I'll ask him. I'll ask him, and I'll I'll tell you. Okay, and then um, I I'm hoping that this will repost on Facebook after our episode here, and we could always probably post some answers there with the comments. Um, let's see, somebody had asked if you play Japanese or just American, and she did answer that. She is learning uh, Japanese, or she's right. starting to learn Japanese style. Right. Nichi is what it's also called. Right. Uh, someone asked if you have a, an automatic mahjong table. No, I don't. I don't. And they are they are a lot of fun, but um, I, I don't have one. I don't know how it would really fit in my life right now, but they are fun and you can really get a lot of games in very quickly. Yeah. And the the thing is, though, I would I would not want to put a vintage set in there. And you really can't, though, because they're all they have magnets inside right. them. So the tiles are special for right. the Mahjong table. Right. So you wouldn't be able to use any ordinary set. You have to have they pro I believe they come with two sets so that it can go through the mechanics of shuffling while you're playing with a set. Um, right. And it kind of does a swap for you. But there's two sets with magnets inside each tile and then the mechanisms are what shuffles them and puts them in their uh, rows or their walls and stacks them based all on magnetics. Really so uh, let me see here if I can, uh, somebody asked something about special dice. Is there, is there anything special about dice that come with these vintage sets? Well, um, some, I mean, there are lots of dice that come. I mean, if you get a, a bone and bamboo one from the 20s, the dice can be in this tiny little coffin that's probably about an inch and a half long. And the dice themselves are about a quarter of an inch high. Okay. Like the cutest little things you've ever seen. So tiny. That's, fun. <laughs> that's really fun. Um, sometimes, depending on the chemical makeup of the dice, some of the dice have completely disintegrated, which of course is a shame. And, um, but D Gallo, once again, is just making some beautiful dice based on probably some ivory dice back in the 1920s. She's made some really lovely dice. And but then there are fun dice. Um, but, you know, those are, these are all new things. But um, I can't think of anything about vintage dice other than just how cute the little bone and bamboo. The, the, the tiny bone ones. Bone. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, listen, is there anything more that you would like to um, add? I think we've covered quite a bit. We have. I just would add that um, I think people should, when they're thinking about a vintage set, they should really just buy it from somebody who actually knows what he or she is selling. Okay. Um, there are so many things to know about vintage sets and about the different tiles and everything else. And I think there are a lot of people out there who are selling sets who might not necessarily be trying to mislead somebody 
Mm-hmm. But if you're going to spend on a vintage money on a vintage set, and it is an investment, but it's an investment in your life, um, just go to somebody who really knows what they're doing. There are a lot of really good dealers out there and go to them because they know what they're doing. They've worked on it. They've restored it if necessary. And you will be getting something that you can trust. That's that's what I would say. Especially if it's going to cost a pretty penny. Yes. Yep. That's great closing advice. Thank you. And thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate you taking the time to talk to us and sharing about your beautiful book and showing us all those amazing tiles. I can't wait to watch the repost because I wasn't able to get super close to my screen. So I'm going to watch this again. I hope that the performance went well on Facebook and that the, um, the, uh, quality of the images will come through. And for those who were able to join us for this episode of Table Talk, I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you were able to see some of these beautiful tiles that Greg was able to share. And I hope you heard us well. Please leave comments below about your experience so that I know whether or not to continue doing these interviews. I sure had a great time. I did too, Good. I, I'm so glad that you, you joined us and um, I'm excited that we're getting to know each other a little more and that our viewers can get to know you a little more as well. So between now and the next episode of Table Talk, may all your picks be keepers. Bye.